This video is going to primarily be about climate change or global warming modeling and comments and criticisms about what the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been doing. They're about to issue a, their fifth report and I have read the draft of it and, and have demonstrated to you some of the shortcomings that it has. It's included on this website which is about uh, evolution and biblical creation due to the science aspects. There are some problems if you look at some of the tapes on evolution and biblical creation you'll see problems with evolution and you'll see uh, scientific backing for the historical account of biblical creation. In a similar vein here I'm going to show you some nonlinear modeling aspects and then show you the data that the uh, United Nations panel is using right now to to compare to their models and you'll see the agreement with their models which is not very good. In any event, before we can begin talking about the specific things about climate change, we need to say a little bit something more general about uh, something we call nonlinear models. So most of the things in the real world that we live in, when they, something changes, they change in a nonlinear manner. And we're going to see in more detail just what that means. But things like climate change, population growth, oil depletion, and many other phenomena in the real world behave nonlinearly. As a simple first pass at what that means, you may be observing something increasing with time and see it historically increasing with time. And you may think that, well, it increased with, with before and it's probably going to increase in the future. That's okay for something we call a linear model, but a nonlinear model behaves in such a way that something that's increasing for a while, later on some other phenomenon, some other factor can come into play and cause what you had been observing to go up to start to go down. And so nonlinear models are the ones that we can't just look at them and extrapolate into the future without modeling them in great detail. And we'll get more into that in, in later slides. Now it turns out that most of us, are, our minds are thinking in terms of linear things. That's the easiest thing to think of. Something that's increasing, we expect them to increase uh, uh, if it's been increasing in the past. The difficulty that you can get into from a scientific standpoint, if you have a nonlinear model, and you apply a linear reasoning to it, you will usually get the wrong answer. You'll get the wrong answer. And you'll see not that the United Nations panel has necessarily been applying linear uh, models to it, but their model that they're using right now that they tell the public is basically, well, carbon dioxide is increasing, and therefore temperature is going to increase, and those two are both increasing for uh, reasons that they give may not necessarily be the case. In fact, the data show that it, that is not the case. Now, just thinking back in terms of people that have made some incorrect uh, predictions about the future using linear reasoning or using some reasoning that, that didn't take every factor into account. Let's just look at these two examples. Uh, there was a book that was written in 1968 or published in 1968 called The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich, a professor at Stanford University. He took a look at the population of the Earth and the measure of, that it was growing at. And then he looked at the Earth's production of food and the measure of what it was growing at. And when he put those two together, he, they saw that the population was growing faster than the food production was. And so he predicted, again in 1968, he predicted that by 1980 there would be mass famine in the world. That there would be, he said in his book, that there would be mass starvation with hundreds of millions of people starving to death because the population is growing too fast and the food production is not growing fast enough. And he predicted that and what happened? Well, in 1968 the population of the earth was about 2 billion people. By 1980 it was close to 4 billion people. So the population had nearly doubled during that time. And did a lot of people starve and die? Well, not, not uh, hundreds of millions in any event, because the United Nations studies themselves demonstrated that at the time in 1980, the amount of food and, and nutrition available to people on Earth was up by 24%. So there was not only uh, no mass starvation, but the amount of food had actually increased beyond what it had been when we had 2 billion people on Earth. Now, Paul Ehrlich doesn't want to give up on that. The population, again, went from about 2 billion to 4 billion by 1980. Uh, today, in 2014, is about 7 billion. And uh, Paul Ehrlich now, as, as recently as 2013, was quoted as saying that 
when the next 2 billion people occupy the earth, when we get up from 7 to 9 billion people, he expects that that's when this population bomb will happen. We won't be able to produce enough food. Uh, based on his track record to this point in time and the track record of food production and population growth, I think it's unlikely that he's even correct on that one, but we'll find out. Another uh, area that uh, where uh, actually a pretty good model was run, but it didn't take into account everything, everything into account. It turns out that a, a fellow by the name of King Hubbard, who was a geophysicist in the oil industry, uh, was studying uh, the amount of energy, amount of oil and gas that, he, uh, that the world knew about at the time, and, and starting in 1949, uh, he published this, this uh, uh, paper in Science Magazine in 1949, and then proceeded to look uh, closer for the next several years, and in 1956, he wrote another uh, technical paper and presented it to an oil industry uh, forum. And at that point in time, he said that uh, the United States was going to have peak oil, the maximum production that could have in 1975. And so in 1956, he predicted that by 1975, the United States would have peak oil production, the most, most production they're going to have, and then it would fall off after that. Now, at the time he made that prediction, 1956, the United States was making about 65% of the Earth's oil and consuming a like percentage, perhaps consuming a little bit more than 65%. We were importing a little bit of oil already. So we made uh, two-thirds uh, of the oil, produced two-thirds of the oil, and we consumed two-thirds of the oil. Uh, by 1975, the United States production had reached about 8 million barrels per day, so it had increased substantially. It's kind of what he, what he called the bell-shaped curve. It was reached up to 8 million barrels per day in 1975, and thereafter it fell off. It then was in the range today of 7 to 8 million barrels a day. So it fell off, but then it, it recovered in its subsequent years, subsequent decades. So King Hubbard was correct that the United States reached its peak in 1975, but what he did not take into account and could not know and did not uh, speculate about was that the world's oil, oil production mushroomed before that time. What happened was that oil was discovered in the Arab countries and Saudi Arabia, Libya, uh, and the Arab Emirates and uh, Air, uh, states like that. And they had a tremendous amount of production that came on stream by 1975. That oil and gas and particularly the oil that they produced was had two main advantages. It was a substantially better oil in the sense that it required a lot less refining, so it was cheaper to, to make into the useful products that we, we make our oil out of. And secondly, it was cheaper to produce. And so it had those two advantages. So that by 1975, the earth was making 40 million barrels a day, and the United States was only producing 15% of it. So Again, King Hubbard was right with his model that we reached peak production, but we did it, he did not take into account that the earth would, would find, uh, other countries would find it, huge quantities of oil and kind of overwhelm the production. So in 1975, we were making about 8 million barrels a day, and that was about only 15% of the uh, earth's production at that time. Well, today, in 2013 and 2014, we make about 80 million barrels per day, the world does, and the United States produces about eight. So, so now we're further a lower percentage. We only produce about 10% of the world's oil production. But again, there's no problem with a shortage of oil in the world today or ever. And my personal experience with the, uh, the quantities of oil that is, are known to be in the uh, Arab states, Saudi Arabia, Libya, etc., you add to that the tremendously large Orinoco tar belt in eastern Venezuela. You add to that the uh, tar sands in Canada, and you add to that the United States and probably other places in the world where shale gas is now tremendous quantity. And then you add the so-called tight gas in the western United States, where in the Uinta, Green River, and Peons Basins, there is enough gas for about 500 years worth of United States domestic production. When you add all these numbers together for these large quantities of oil and gas that we know of today, I believe that there are thousands of years of oil and gas production left inside of the earth. 
Let's take a, a kind of a general look at climate change that's going on in the earth or has gone on in the earth and the modeling of it uh, in uh, current day uh, efforts by the United Nations to model uh, climate change. First of all, uh, you'll see in the next two slides that there's been a lot of uh, changes in the uh, earth's climate and it's been going on in cycles for millions of years. We have about a million years worth of data that I'll show you shortly that indicate that the earth has gone through these cycles. And it's a naturally occurring phenomenon that uh, many scientists believe is controlled by what we call sunspot activity. I won't explain too much about that, but basically the sun is a huge ball of hydrogen and it's held together by gravitational forces. Uh, at the center of the sun, those forces are so large that it's very hot. And so this hydrogen in the center of the sun is so hot that it actually fuses, or you can think of it as burns, into helium. So a couple of hydrogen atoms come together, fuse together, and they form a helium atom. When that happens, there's a little bit of energy left over, and that we call radiation, and that radiation makes its way to the surface of the sun, and once it gets to the surface, it takes about eight minutes to travel to us, and we call that sunlight. So the sun is this hydrogen furnace that's going on making helium, but it's not all that uniform at all times, and it has some irregular behavior, which we call sunspots. It happens every once in a while in the relatively known cycles that these sunspots appear, They've been observed for a long time. The earliest uh, written observation of it goes back to 800 BC with some Chinese observers recording the site of these sunspots. Uh, it, the first drawing of the sun with the spots on it that's been recovered to date comes from about 1128 AD. And starting in 1610 when the telescope was invented, there's more data that's come on stream as uh, astronomers have observed carefully without burning their eyes out have observed the uh, changes in behavior of these sunspots. So sunspots have been recorded. Very briefly, sunspots are kind of dark areas on the surface of the sun that result, we think, as a result of magnetic uh, influence within the sun. So there's a magnetic character to the sun and it, it causes these dark spots, which it basically the magnetic behavior causes the certain parts of the sun to not freely convect or freely move and freely give up their energy. And so they become relatively cool spots in a sense, and they inhibit or prevent the radiation from leaving the sun in that particular zone as much as it normally would. And therefore, the more sunspots in effect, kind of the cooler the uh, amount of energy that, that is uh, sent away from the sun toward us. And that's uh, one of the reasons why our, our climate cycles up and down. I don't want to go through much, too much more about that. but it has been observed. There are various uh, cycles that these sunspots go through, ranging from 11 years long to 87 years to 250 plus years and longer cycles. And it's not actu actually or accurately known uh, what the overall cycle really is. There have been various measures of it, and scientists are still working on that to understand exactly how this cycle works. But we know that this cycle happens, and it's thought that uh, there's enough evidence to indicate that these two degrees centigrade up and down cycles that we see are related most directly to sunspot activity. Now one of the questions that you can ask today about the uh, changes that uh, man is observing in the climate today is, is something that mankind is doing, in particular burning carbon, burning gasoline and coal, and re releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Is that buildup of carbon dioxide causing extra warming of the earth uh, as opposed to what uh, these cycles would indicate as a normal cycling of things. And so that's a question that could be answered if we have an extremely detailed mathematical model of the Earth's climate. And we have to be able to take all the past history of the Earth with that model, and that's, I'll spend a bunch of time talking about nonlinear modeling and how this is done, and how at this point in time the modeling that the United Nations has been doing is not accurate enough to make any forward predictions. But in theory, if we had an extremely good model of the climate, and if we had the uh, data fit it very well, then we could extrapolate to the future and indicate, well, is this just this normal 1,500-year uh, cycle that we're observing right now, or is it something much more uh, important related to the fact that man is adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere? I think right now that uh, the carbon dioxide argument does not have any proof. So 
even with in spite of that, the United Nations panel is going ahead and making predictions about the future, and they're about to release their fifth report on this. Uh, I think the first one is about 1997, and their fifth one is about to come out, and they're making the same sorts of predictions that they have all along, that there's going to be dire consequences for the Earth in the not-too-distant future, and that we're going to have all kinds of melting of uh, the Arctic and Antarctic and the sea rise uh, levels going to go up so much that they're going to flood land and we're not going to be able to make food and people are going to starve. And so all of these sorts of uh, predictions are continuously being made. And as you'll see at the end of this video, may being made with a model that doesn't very accurately describe the past. So if you don't very accurately describe the past, how can you possibly make any predictions in the future? So if I ask the question, are the current UN climate models accurate future predictors? I give it a definite no. They are not accurate future predictors. Uh, and in order to understand that answer that I've given you is no, we need to spend a, a few slides here and look at what this nonlinear modeling in general is about and what nonlinear modelers know about how you have to go about this and the degree with which you have to have excellent agreement between your model and the data in hand. Uh, and only when you have that can you make forward prediction. And say that one more time, the UN's panel does not have sufficiently accurate nonlinear models to make any predictions about tomorrow, the next year, or 10 or 100 years from now. And I'll explain that to you after a number of slides so you can learn about nonlinear modeling. So here is uh, information on this 1,500-year cycle I was talking about, 12 to 1,500 years, and the general idea and the results are of, of uh, studies that you'll see on the next slide from uh, quite a number of different areas. There is a, a book that I recommend you read if you want to understand this in more detail. You don't need to be a scientist to read and understand this book, but it's called Unstoppable Global, Global Warming Every 1,500 Years. It's by Fred Slinger and Dennis Avery. And what they conclude is that basically the Earth goes through this cyclical temperature cycle shown here by this red curve. So we've got this red cycle here, about 1,500 years. Some of the data are about 1,200 years, but it's basically this kind of a cycle that the Earth's temperature goes through. It goes up 2 degrees centigrade, and it goes down 2 degrees centigrade off the average over time. Using the United Nations panel's own climate data from 1860 to today, it turns out we are about 150 years into this cycle, and that's we have increased the Earth's temperature from 1860 about three quarters of a degree centigrade. We're set to go up in the next 200 years about another one and one quarter degree for a total of two degrees, but thereafter we will decline with temperature, say the data that we have, and I'll show you in the next slide the wide sources of this data, which gives me great confidence that it's correct. The other thing that was found in these data that I'll show you on the next slide is the rather ironic situation in which they have measured these temperature cycles and they've also measured the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere at the time these temperature cycles were going through. And here's what they have seen. They have seen that the carbon dioxide buildup occurs after the temperature heating has occurred and occurs after when the temperature starts to decline. So the carbon dioxide builds up after the temperature buildup, not before or not as a cause of it. And therefore, the carbon dioxide buildup is not related to a temperature increase. In fact, it's related to the temperature decrease. And uh, again, read the book if you want to see more reasoning, technical scientific reasoning as to how, this, how they measured these things and what the implications are. Now here's a kind of a summary of that 1500 year cycle for climate data, and let's just look at it. Now, the Earth has experienced over 600 cycles like that I just showed you, about 1500 years, over the last million years. So one million years worth of data, which have been gathered from things I'll show you in a minute, from ice cores and uh, seabed sediments and corals and all these various things. We have about a million years worth of data seeing these cycles repeat time after time after time. The other thing that we know that's important is that that cycle correlates with the activity and intensity of sunspots. I've explained to you briefly what sunspots are, and they've been recorded, uh, not photographically, but recorded in written text for many centuries and are actively looked at now with uh, uh, 
telescopes, et cetera, to see just how active the sun is. And that's what correlates with this temperature fluctuation up two degrees centigrade and down two degrees centigrade. And as I said already, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does not cause that, say these data, and in fact, it lags by about 800 years after the warming has gone to its maximum two degrees when it starts to decline back toward the average temperature, then the carbon dioxide levels build up. So the carbon dioxide is a result, not a cause of this whole thing. Now the most interesting thing is this last point here. This 1500 year, and again 12 to 1500 year cycle, so there's a little bit of scatter in some of these tech technologies, but have been found by quite a number of, of diverse technologies well-established scientific areas get basically the same answer uh, from looking at different aspects of the history of the year. Uh, first of these I just talked about is Arctic and Anti Antarctic ice cores. So what do you do? You go to a location on the Arctic or Antarctic, you set up a drilling rig there, and you drill and take a full suite as long a core as you can drill, and they get about a million years worth of core for the temperature cycles that the Earth has gone through. Then you analyze it for in various well-known scientific ways and see the length of, of he heating and cooling. And again, they come up with about 1,500 years of this heating and cooling and see the carbon dioxide as a result of the cooling part of that cycle as opposed to as a cause for the warming part of that cycle. In addition to that, uh, you can send a drill ship out into the ocean somewhere and they send it in quite a variety number of different parts of the earth. And you can take a core and drill a core there, get the seabed sediments. Again, you can get hundreds of thousands of years worth of seabed sediments, analyze it, and find somewhere between a 12 and 1500 degree, a 12 and 1500 year uh, cycling of this temperature, and again, find that the CO2 behaves in the opposite way as currently popular today. You can do the same thing with coral reefs. They've been around for quite a while, and you can take samples from coral reefs and get that same 12 to 15 year cycle from peat bogs, from iron dust, from tree rings, and a number, four or five additional areas of technology where the scientists in their own area of expertise have looked at the information they had, the data they have, done the research projects, and strangely come up with virtually the same sort of cyclical behavior for the Earth that gives me a great level of confidence that this is the right answer. Now before we can get look at the uh, current United Nations panel data and models, we need to look at a little bit more and, you, and understand what these models are about, how they work, and, and we'll just we'll, uh, bear, bear with me for uh, a number of slides here where we talk about mathematical modeling, linear modeling, nonlinear modeling, and I'll show you examples of those of what, what we're talking about. You need to understand that so you can look at the behavior of the United Nations nonlinear model and understand what the problem is. Now it starts out, there are certainly two mathematical axioms that you have to have when you're going to do mathematical modeling. Scientists observe something that's happening they measure it, they gather data from it, and then they want to come up with a model, whether a, a algebraic model that describes it or hopefully a model that has some scientific laws in it. And you combine whatever you need to combine in order to get an explanation, but you ultimately end up with a mathematical model, something that you, today you could run on a computer. In order to, to be this sort of a thing that we call modeling, you, in addition to that model, you have to have data. So you have to have data for use to compare your model to. It's no, not good enough to have a model in your mind and just say that, well, this is the model, I believe it, and then use it in a forward prediction. Without validating it with data, that sort of a thing is, makes no sense. And that is mostly where the United Nations panel is right now. Their model is not calibrated, is not in agreement with the temperature data of the Earth. And unless you do that, and make it into agreement, you cannot believe anything it says in the forward direction. And what it amounts to is that to date, none of the climate models predicting this future calamity where the earth's going to heat up and the ice, ice core, uh, poles are going to melt and the sea level will rise and uh, areas will be flooded and, and people will die for lack of food and arable land and all that sort of thing. That's uh, not anything that you could say yet because these climate models that they have have not been about, uh, evaluated 
have not been made to, to, to be in agreement with the data that we now have. And the second thing that's of equal importance, uh, in addition to having the data, when you use a nonlinear model, and again, I'll show you that in these slides, uh, you must ensure that it's a very, very close fit. It's not a good enough to have that model fit kind of to the eye, and again, I'll show you that in a few slides. It has to fit by some, some uh, analysis methods that uh, experienced nonlinear uh, modeling people know about. You have to make sure that this quality of this fit is very good. And when it is very good, then and only then can one predict in the future what is going to happen uh, in whatever you're modeling. Now, there are two types of models that uh, are available to mathematical models, uh, kind of simple and complex. And the simple one is the linear model. Again, I'll show you examples of that in a minute. They're simple, they're accurate, and there's no question about predicting in the future. And so if everything were linear, we would have a simple time. We probably wouldn't need very many scientists around. But unfortunately, most everything in the real world is nonlinear. Most of the things that we're trying to, to model and look at are, are nonlinear, which means they're very complex. And as I've already stated, they need very careful analysis of the degree with which the model and data are, are in agreement, and unless you do that, your model is useless. And it turns out, as I've said several times already, that all climate models are highly nonlinear. So they are very complex, and they need a very careful analysis for the goodness and the degree with which the model fits the actual data you have. Now here are uh, graphs of uh, the two types of data that I've talked about, linear data. Here's something, some parameter y that's just increasing with calendar date, increasing with time, and just, you know, kind of a straight line here, a certain slope. And presumably the next one's going to be here, and the next one's going to be there. It's just going to go up in a straight line. And that's linear data, easy to deal with. The data on the right here, that I call nonlinear data, is different. It's increasing for a while and then tipping over, and it can do a wide variety of different things. I've just shown this as a simple uh, increasing uh, function that just reduces its, its rate of increase over time. Another facet, uh, and these are both computer-generated sets of data, obviously, and there's another facet to this nonlinear data that we see basically in all real-world data when we measure things. And there you can see there's some irregularity, some scatter here. I've actually added that mathematically. I'll explain to that in a minute. But that's something we always see. And we need to be able to fit this and uh, have a good understanding of just what these data tell us. And that's the situation that the United Nations climate models are in. Data that they have in hand that's nonlinear, and it has some scatter in it. So let's look at two very simple examples of linear models. Again, the easy ones, the ones that we can always bring into the future without any question. Suppose you were born in the year 2000, and today in 2014, suppose this is your birthday. So today you're 14 years old. At 14 years old, here is the plot of your age versus the calendar date. And in 2014, you're 14 years old. What's going to happen next year? You're going to be 15 on this day, 16, 17, 18. So your age, uh, no mystery, just increases one year every year that you're alive at least. And it's a model that's kind of overly simple. You would never probably want to ha construct one like this, putting a dot there for each of your age. But it just illustrates what a linear model is, age versus day. Let's look at a second one up here. Suppose you borrowed $100,000 at 5% interest for 30 years in 2000. And so the mortgage company calculated what you owe them, and you owe them $536.82 every month for 30 years, and you've paid off your mortgage. And what happened since the year 2000 up to 2014 is you paid $536.82. And the next year and the years thereafter, up to a total of 30 years, you will be paying $536.82 if it indeed is a fixed uh, contract. So that's really a, also something that you probably wouldn't want to plot out. It's just the same number every year for 30 years. So linear models are real easy, simple, and if only the world were linear, we would have 
a need for less scientists, and the scientists we have would have a very easy job. Let's look at a set, an example of nonlinear data. And so there happened to have been this gentleman, a count, Count Rumford, in 1798. He lived in Bavaria, and he studied heat flow from a cannon that he had drilled out. So he had a big chunk of metal, and he drilled out the center of it to form a cannon. And then for some reason, they had a little bit of interest in science, I guess, he started to measure and for at least the next 40 minutes, he measured the temperature of that metal cannon to see what, how it was cooling versus time. And this is what it looked like, the data, circles. And then here's the first model will fit through it. So here is a model that fits through it. And you can just tell by eye, that doesn't look too good. In this area here, the model over predicts what, what actually happened. And here it behaves the opposite way. And so it's not, not a very good fit that we probably would say we discard that. Well, here is the, the mathematical model that it has. And it has one good attribute in that in very long time, this term will drop out and will reach 70 degrees, which is the right answer for a very long time because the count reports that it was 70 degrees when he did this test. So it should ultimately, you know, assuming the day is long enough for temperature stays constant or something, it should reach 70 degrees. So this model had one good aspect, but it certainly wasn't very good at describing exactly what went on with the data. Let's look at a second model. Again, the same data with the circles, and you can see this model goes through it, not perfectly, but would you say better? It certainly is a better fit to the eye. And here is the model that it is with 105.99 plus 23 times this exponential function. And so it's got a good look to the eye, but there is a problem. And the problem is that at very long times, this term is going to go away, and we're going to end up with a final long-term answer of 106 degrees. So it seems to be a better model, but it is not a sufficient model. And the experienced nonlinear modeler would look at this tail end stuff here and say, hey, something's going on here. If I had one more data point, it would really be off. So we saw this trend going on here, uh, a nonlinear experience, nonlinear model. But that'll be clear in a few minutes as to what, what that would mean to the eye of a nonlinear model. But in any event, this is an example of nonlinear data. And it, with either one of these two models, it's not modeled correctly. Now let's take okay, the next two slides, uh, this slide and the next slide. Let's look at the seven steps that a nonlinear modeler needs to go through in order to ensure that his model and data are in excellent, very, very good agreement. Uh, the first step, obviously, is, is something that we do in every, most every scientific endeavor, and that is to gather the data. We gather the data to be interested in modeling, and for climate modeling, that would be the Earth's temperature versus basically time, but other problems parameters such as the location on Earth. You may model various parts of the Earth and then add them together for the average temperature. And there are other things like sunspot activity, um, radiation, solar radiation absorption in clouds and rain, uh, the solubility of carbon dioxide in the oceans, etc. So we may do uh, a wide variety of things like that, but basically gather as much data we can and understanding what the Earth's temperature is versus the various parameters, the various things that went on versus time to control that temperature. A nonlinear modeler then decides on the first pass a nonlinear model to use. Again, an experienced modeler would have either have the science that he knows about, uh, adding various scientific uh, laws together, or would have some empirical equations to describe things, but he puts together on a, a model based upon experience. And the experienced modeler, knowing that this first model, chances are, is not going to be the final version, is going to have to do some iterations to modify it because that model that he first guesses will not fit necessarily very well with the data. Uh, the current climate models done by the UN panel have taken the approach, as far as I can tell, that they have models for various parts of the overall uh, climate problem, climate uh, simulation. They know, for example, how think they know how carbon dioxide is dissolved in ocean water versus temperature, depth, pressure, salinity, etc. And they know how 
uh, radiation is absorbed in clouds and how rainfall affects this and whatever. So they know a lot of these things. They know a lot of these individual behaviors of the that uh, are involved in the climate. And as far as I can tell at this point, they're basically assuming that when you have lots of different models that all seem to work pretty well, you put them together and that means that the whole climate model should work pretty well by when you put all these good parts together. Well, that's not a good assumption. You'll see that that uh, right now their, their assumption of putting these models together has not resulted in at a very good fit, a sufficiently good fit of the data that we have in hand. What a typical nonlinear model does, does at this point, and as far as I know, this has not been done with the climate change models in any, to any good extent at, at the very least, is that he would take a, his model and his data and do a, what we call a nonlinear regression in a least squared sense. And I'll show you a minute, bit about what the nonlinear regression is. There are computer programs that perform this nonlinear regression, and basically what they do is in your model you would have some constants some uh, values that you think you know the value of the constant and you put it into your model but uh, you can allow those constants to be modified by this nonlinear regression program to come up with a better fit of the data. In other words the data are speaking to you what they need those constants to be in order to be in good agreement with the theory. And so a nonlinear regression analysis is done uh, with uh, resulting in usually new better more improved constants for the model. In the fourth step, we get into something that we call the analysis of residuals. So we have residuals, and the residual of a given data point is the difference between the calculated and observed value, so calculated minus observed, divided by the observed's observed value. Now this is a dimensionless thing, and it's a ratio type thing, and because we've divided by the observed value, and case of a climate model by the observed temperature at that particular time, that eliminates any uh, bias to the temperature differences as opposed to fractional temperature differences. So this basically makes each data point of equal value. Now what we do then is we plot these residuals, these differences between calculated and observed divided by observed, uh, versus uh, things like time and other uh, variables in our problem to look for any regularity. If any regularity is seen in some parts of that nonlinear model are not adequate. And again, this will become clearer when I show you the examples that are follow here in a couple of slides. So at that point, you see some regularity in these residuals. You modify your model to remove those to different algebra, different uh, theory, different concept, whatever. And then you repeat these first five steps a number of times until you get to a good point where you analyze these residuals and everything looks great. You are then uh, done the best you can with your model and you then can predict for the future and then of course uh, observe in the future what happens and check to make sure that your model is really correct. But that's what a nonlinear modeler does. It's, it's analogous to the scientific method that you've seen on, on uh, other videos on this website, but that's what a nonlinear modeler does to get a good answer in the end. Let's just look briefly at a little bit more detail about what this nonlinear regression business is. And this is the last word slide where you'll see steps that a nonlinear modeler goes through. And the rest we'll see data. So hold on, one more slide. Uh, what we do with uh, a nonlinear regression program is we again have our proposed model with an initial guess of whatever the fit parameters are that we're trying to, to alter to give a better fit. We calculate the residuals. This in terms of the calculated value minus the observed value divided by the observed for each point. So they're in fractional form, giving equal value to each data point in a sense. Then we square those residuals. We multiply them by themselves and square them. And squaring them means that they will all be positive. So if it's a positive differential, you square it, it's still positive. If it's a negative residual and you square it, it will again be positive. So we, we want to treat each point equally. We don't want negative residuals and positive residuals canceling each other out on, on nearby data points which would give us a false sense that we have a good fit. So we square it, we sum it up, and then very briefly what the nonlinear regression program does is it minimizes and makes that sum of squares of differences between data and, and uh, uh, calculated values to be, to be minimal and it finds a set of those fit parameters that give the best value 
it can happen that uh, our initial guess for the parameters might not be quite right and we, the regression wouldn't work, so we change our initial guess and then finally we'll end up with a good minimum sum of squares with the residuals looking about right. So we have to again look at the residual patterns, make sure there's nothing regular about the, the way these differentials are behaving. And then there's something that I don't have the desire or time to get into. You have to do parameter sensitivity. If in your fit of your with your model there happened to be one parameter that uh, was very sensitive to determine what the degree of uh, fit, uh, like let's just say constant number seven in the regression model happened to be the one that's very strongly controlling how this fit goes. It may be about some phenomena, phenomenon that uh, you can do further studies on to refine that, such as the solubility of carbon dioxide in seawater. Send some ships out and get measurements of just what's going on with that and refine that constant even better than you have with this fit. So that's what one does. One does this nonlinear regression. It's uh, something that all nonlinear modelers ultimately do. So let's look at some synthetic data and then I'll show you the United Nations uh, climate model data that they have in their preliminary report that was just issued in uh, April. Uh, beginning of May. And, but the data I'm going to show you in the next few slides before I show you their data is going to be synthetic data that I calculated. Here are the data. It's the same one that you saw in a much earlier slide where I showed you a linear an example of linear data and nonlinear data. So this is just uh, calculated values that are increasing with time and kind of bending over here. And I mentioned earlier that there's some scattering of the data. And this is something that all real world data has. And I actually used a, what mathematicians know as a random number generator, which is the best it can generates a random uh, difference for some of these data points. So I've given this that real world look of scatter that we always have whenever we run uh, any kind of test. We always have a little bit of uncertainty measuring this parameter or that parameter. We may be a little bit off our thermometer or pressure gauge might be a little bit off and we get a a wrong value once or twice. So we have that scatter, what we call random error in the data, and all data has it. So let's take this data set and analyze it by two models, model A and B, and see what it looks like. So here's the first model, fit number one from using model A. And model A is just this simple equation here, this y parameter is calculated to be one constant times time, A times time, over another constant b plus time. So it's the multiplying by a and then dividing it by b plus time. A very simple model. And the data, again, that I had generated were fit with a nonlinear regression program and it gave me that solid red line. And the constants that it were found were 2.762 and 1 1.809. So those values of the constant give a very close fit. And if you look at that by eyeball, you kind of like it. It looks pretty good. Uh, yeah, it doesn't go through every point because those points have that random error associated with them. But it looks pretty good, like that might be a good fit. But that's not good enough, again, just for us to look at that by eyeball. And I'll let you in a secret. It turned out that the calculations for this model before they were given this random error had A of 2.75 and B of 1.85. So it found close to those values that were the actual values, but it got hindered a little bit because of the scatter that I added to the data in addition to it. So it got fooled a little bit, but it got basically a very good to the eye looking model. However, let's look with those same, uh, with the same model, again, A times time over B plus time, with the same final fit values are there, we need to first look at the residuals. And here are the residuals, the difference between calculated and observed divided by observed. And you can see that at the very least, there's some above the line and some below the line and no regular, real regular trend other than this bouncing above and below the line. And it turns out if you look at that carefully, about half of the data points are above the line with positive residuals and the other half are below the line with negative residuals and there is no well-defined scatter pattern here that would lead us to believe that, hey, there's something wrong with this data. This scatter that we see indeed looks like random error, random experimental error. And so this is a very good model, model A, to fit the data. It looks great. 
And we know that the model was pretty close to the values that it found, and so we know that that is a good model. Let's look now at model B. Model B is a bit more complex. It has four constants, C, D, E, and N. So it's C times time to the nth power divided by D plus time plus E times time squared. And the general nonlinear modeling business, the more parameters you allow to be free or to be regressed upon or be estimated by the program, in general, the better the, better the fit. The more degrees of freedom we, we say in lingo, the better the fit to the data. So I've got four uh, degrees of freedom, four constants here that I've regressed on versus two in the prior model. And you, I might have expected that, hey, this is going to be a better fit. Well, the green line is the fit that was regressed upon. And if you look at it, it looks pretty good. And most people who are not experienced in nonlinear modeling would say, yeah, that's a good model. That's just as equally good as the other one. Whereas an experienced nonlinear modeler would be worried about these last four or five points. We're going to see that the model for each and every one of those five points, one, two, three, four, five, is overestimating the measured value. And that's a regular trend that we cannot tolerate. It would indicate to a nonlinear model that there is a problem in the model that need to be fixed to eliminate what's going on here. Now for uh, someone who's not experienced in nonlinear modeling, the next slide will show you more clearly by looking at the residuals of what was going on here. And here are the residuals. For about the first 20 years, it seemed, looks very much like Model A. Everything seems to be going along. All right, no problem. Good model. But then we see these last five data points have a, a bad uh, outcome in that they're all positive. There seems to be an increasing trend, and they are positive. And just being all positive is enough to say there's something wrong with this model. And again, you know that that this is not the model that I generated the original data from, and so no, there's no reason why this should really closely fit, and indeed it doesn't. And this model, therefore, is something that would be discarded or modified to get to a better fit in some way or other. So suppose we had not done that close look at Model B, and we had just run Model B versus the data and said, yeah, that looks pretty good, and not looked at the residuals. Here is what the result would have been. Both of those models, as they were fit by the data, you saw remember, up to about 25 years, it didn't look all that bad, but it was for the green model, we, where was that problem? Here's what they do in the long term. The green model in 250 years goes up to a substantially higher value than the correct model, Model A, over that time period. Model A is just bending over. It's hard to say. It looks almost like a straight line, but it's bending over slightly. So the point of what you've just seen with these synthetic data is that you must be very careful, very rigorously look at these residuals to make sure that they have no regular trend. And if there is a regular trend, then you need to modify your model to eliminate that regular trend and reach to the point where the trend in the residuals is this random error business of having about half of them above the line, half of them below the line, and no distinct pattern to them other than maybe cyclically going above and, above and below the line. So anyway, that's looking at synthetic data, and it's a, a problem that you need to be aware of as a nonlinear modeler. And my contention is that right now, the United Nations panel on climate change is doing something close to the green line. So as I said earlier, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is about to issue their fifth report. It'll come out in October of 2014, and they have uh, already uh, issued the rough draft or the preliminary version of it for people to look at. And that I read that climate modeling, por climate modeling portion of that uh, report, and I'm basing the next few slides on what I gleaned from studying that report. Now, they themselves admit or talk about the fact that during the last 15 years, from 1998 to 2013, and same as 
holding up so far in 2014, there has been what they term a cooling hiatus, a cooling anomaly, a cooling vacation from heating, a cooling uh, difference between what was predicted by their models. We should be warmer now than they had predicted uh, during these last 15 years, or we should be warmer during the last 15 years than has been observed during these last 15 years. And so that's a problem. We've had a cooling hiatus with the temperatures rising less, significantly less, than they predicted in their prior report number four. Now, they're ready to release that, and the problem is that they have not accounted for that cooling hiatus in any model sort of a way. They've talked about it and said some words about the fact that it may just be something that will disappear uh, in the next 15 years. Maybe we'll get back on the same track. But again, with nonlinear modelers, when you're trying to extrapolate such, such something as important as this into the future, you just cannot stop at that point and continue using their model. And as I've said already, their model looks somewhat like Model B. And I'll show you the residuals uh, to show you that the regular pattern that they've seen in their residuals. It's, uh, Something that, again, an experienced nonlinear model would be very concerned about and would not use the model that they currently have to extrapolate into the future. It would be very risky to do that. So my contention is that they must bring their model into agreement with the data for the last 15 years. And I'll show you there's also another 30-year period between 1900 and 1930 where the same thing occurred. And right now they're not accounting for that hiatus as well. So they need to do a nonlinear regression. I realize these are very complex time com computer time consuming models, but they need to allow some of the parameters in their models to be regressed upon so that they can get a better fit, a more complete fit of the data. One way or another, change the models, regress on the models, do something to get all the data in agreement, and then I too will believe what you're saying about the future. Here is a uh, page from page 768 of their fifth report. And it kind of summarizes the temperature models and the temperature data that they have. Again, starting in 1860, uh, the several lines in here that are sort of easy to see, and you know, there's quite a jumble of lines. The solid, thick black line that you see is what has been measured as the Earth's temperature average temperature on the Earth versus time. So there's enough data from 1860, and of course, obviously, the better data are in recent decades with um, measurement techniques and satellites to get data from remote places and all that. But the solid black line is what the temperature data says. These wild jumbling lines here that you see, and you probably can't see them very well, but above and below the line, there are a whole bunch of, of different colored curves Various governmental agencies, universities, and et cetera, have uh, set up their climate change models and calculated what they think the temperature, uh, according to the models, would be versus time. Now, there is another curve on there that's a little bit easier to see and uh, individual lines, and there's a solid red curve here. You can see it above the black line, and there's a solid red curve here above the black measured temperatures of the Earth between about 1900 and 1930. Uh, then the, the differences that are in those two regions are significant for a nonlinear modeler. Let's just look more closely at this recent year data here. And again, here's the Earth's temperature, the solid black line. And here's what the average of their model say should be the Earth's temperature versus time. Again, over predicting this is what they think, they thought in the last report, the Earth should be doing. And instead, it's got this cooling hiatus, this lower temperature than they expect from what their models previously had said and what their models today still say. So that is a significant problem to have your model predict. And again, if you now with having seen that blown up area here, I did not blow up this area between 1900 and 1930, but again, the red line for most of the data points during those years of the Earth's temperatures above, and so there's a problem there as well. They need to correct these, they need to make these fit, they need to come back with an average of all their models, or as, uh, with one or two individual models that very closely model everything. At that point, extrapolating into the future, then will have scientific meaning, scientific believability. They are not there today, 
and anything they predict about the future right now with our models cannot be believed. Now, I just by eyeball, with, I looked at those <laughs> data under a magnifying glass and picked out for about every five years up until 2013, I picked out the residuals, the calculated, average calculated from their model versus the observed divided by the observed, the residuals, and here's what they are for those points. And you see they are <clears throat> above the line. They're all positive for that long period of time, which is not good. That's an indicator there's a flaw in their model. And it may be that they're also increasing with time. These last couple of points are a little worrisome being higher than the early ones. So they may be getting worse in terms of their prediction for the future of what's going to happen with the Earth's temperature uh, versus time. So let's just kind of summarize it here then, what, what we've concluded. You looked at uh, what modeling is, linear modeling, nonlinear modeling. You've looked at the count uh, from Bavaria, his uh, sample of nonlinear data, and it's, it's all throughout the scientific literature and scientific areas of people dealing with nonlinear data. And they, when they try to extrapolate it to the future to predict what will happen, they go through the type of things that I've described to you about nonlinear uh, fits, uh, regressions, getting a look at the residuals, et cetera, to get the best fit. So let's tailor this down and conclude what the UN has been doing. Well, because of them overpredicting uh, warming for the last 15 years, as well as between 1900 and 1930, that's a flag that says there's something, there's a fundamental flaw with their models, and any kind of forward calculations at this point are highly speculative and really cannot be believed. You need to bring them in, uh, into agreement one way or another. They've got enough manpower and computer power to, to force these things to to fit, to look at the residuals and do the sensitivity evaluation to see what's really controlling this. I think what they're going to ultimately uh, conclude, if they really look at this close enough, they're going to see perhaps this uh, 15 or 12 or 1500 year cycle happening. They're going to see the, the temperature increases in the current cycle we're in, not increasing with time, but reducing with time, such that the rate of increase reduces. They're going to see that sine wave, that curve, where I said we're 150 years into this 1500 year cycle. But at the very least, the United Nations climate modelers need to take into account the data from all these other parts of the scientific community about cyclical uh, temperature behavior of the Earth as driven by sunspots. If they neglect that, they are violating one of the fundamental uh, rules or commitments of scientists, climate modeling scientists, as well as any other scientist dealing in, in the area of, of investigating some area, you need to follow the data wherever it may lead. Socrates said this uh, a long, long time ago that uh, anyone doing an intellectual or scientific investigation to some area needs to be open-minded such that you follow the data wherever it may lead. I think the climate model stuff that they're doing is going to lead to the conclusion that the Earth is not being heated at an extreme rate compared to other centuries, other time periods, but that it is just part of this 1500 year cycle. And that would be really the way that, or either that or they need to explain the flaws in these 10 or 12 different scientific disciplines who find this same cyclical Earth behavior. So there's that. Again, I recommend that you read Unstoppable Global Warming every 1,500 years if you want more details on what uh, the real good data seems to be and the fits that we have to that information. There's one other book I would suggest by Ronald Bailey, and that is Global Warming and Other Eco Myths. He talks about global warming problems in a little bit different way, but uh, talks about other areas where kind of science has gone, scientists have gone a little bit awry from normal scientific principles without having the data to back up what they're concluding. In any event, thank you for listening to this videotape.